Hey, give it up for our lovely dancers and drummers. Give it up, family. Ashe. Whether you made it to the grass or not, how can you not move your body to the rhythm that our ancestors have given us? Can I get it? I shade that family. Can I get one? That's right. That's right. So at this time, we're going to press on and we're in for a treat. Some of you who know Dr. Malefi Katie Asante may know the trend for a treat. And for those who are not familiar with him and his work, will just take my word for it, in for a treat. Dr. Asante is no stranger to the Temple of New African Thought family. He's no stranger to our conscious black business network. That's right. And for those who are interested in our conscious black business network, all you have to do is hop on ConsciousBlackBusiness.com. And there, family, you can find our 24-7 shows and our blogs and all of the things that we have to offer in regard to media of empowerment for black people, our people. Dr. Asante is no stranger to the Temple of New African Thought because as of right now, as part of our Rashule book study class, which is on Sundays right here, 3221 Bel Air Road, Baltimore, Maryland, from 9.45 to 11, we're going through the book that I have in my hands entitled Afrocentricity, authored by Dr. Asante. Ashe. Dr. Asante is no stranger to African people, and African people are no stranger to him. When I say that, I'm not just saying those things in mere words, but oftentimes, Many of our scholars, many of those who are accomplished in academia are in fact unreachable and not accessible. Anybody know what I'm talking about? But he's one who doesn't put himself above the people. Dr. Asante was born in Valdosta, Georgia and is professor and chair of the Department of African Studies at Temple University. While at Temple University in 1988, he instituted the first doctoral program for African American studies to be offered by any other university. He is one of our foremost distinguished scholars and has authored over 83 plus books. And I say plus because he's in the process of working towards more and more works as we speak. He's written over 550 articles, essays, journals, books, and he's the founder of the theory Afrocentricity. He served as an educational consultant for several school districts throughout the country and is widely known for his work on African culture and philosophy throughout the world and in his travels. He has recently completed his book entitled Revolutionary Pedagogy, Primer for Teachers of Black Children. Hold it up, Dr. Santi Ashe. There it is right there, family. All right? Ashe. So, Dr. Asante has devoted his life to the advancement and upliftment and the progressive evolution of African people. And so he has contributed many things to our people, and so we're delighted to be able to have him here today. So, as we go about this healing process, as we go about this healing journey, let us focus ourselves. Let us take mental note. Let us get out something to write with and something to write on if necessary. But let's seize the moment. Yeah. That's right. Ashe, let's seize the opportunity. Ashe. And let's humble ourselves to what it is that Dr. Asante has come to share with us all the way from Philadelphia. All right? So at this time, please give a black tacit welcome for another than Dr. Malefi Ketty Asante Ashe. Ashe. Hotel brothers and sisters. Wow, it's great to be here in Baltimore because you're at the center of all the possibilities of our people. And that's why you are under such pressure. So we're, we're here to talk with you to uh, discuss uh, revolutionary pedagogy. But we're also here, I want to say I'm here, uh, to thank 
uh, Minister Osa and Brother Sankofa uh, and the Temple of New Africa, uh, the, the people who have done such wonderful thing by bringing all of us together. Just look at yourself well, well, and think well. of how you have been resilient. Well, well, well. You, you, we, we're beautiful people. We're incredible. And I, I, I meet us and I just say, wow, what we have come through what we have been able to do, despite all kinds of inequities and all kinds of situations, is remarkable. And as a people, there are no people any more noble than Africans who have lived in the belly of the beast here in America. You are a noble people and a beautiful people. And I stand here to give thanks to all of our ancestors. And the names, some of them have been mentioned today, and that is just glorious. When we mention the name of Ella Baker, I mean, we, we have to think and pause at this beautiful, dynamic sister who helped to make it possible that we create organizations, youth organizations that would be strong and powerful. And we could just list many like Fannie Lou Hamer, who was so great and so eloquent in her defense of black people. She hadn't finished high school. Uh, she had only been educated in the cotton fields of Mississippi. And she understood by working on the plantations in Mississippi uh, that white racism was an obscene and vile doctrine. And she, in her own life and in her own spirit, showed us that it was nothing but a farce. Right. So I, I look at all of these outstanding, I don't know, I mean, and I'm not just saying this, I, I, but I think about it a lot. I, 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 I read about it uh, read as much as I can about history, and I just don't know where you could find any aggregation or congregation of people anywhere in the world with such heroic characters. Right. I, I just can't think of it. If you just ask me to identify what place, what region on the earth, where can you find so many heroic people who rise up every day to speak truth to any kind of power. And you can start at the very beginning when we petitioned Massachusetts in the 1760s for equality. This is what black people did. You can start even earlier than that, but when we got to this country, we saw the injustice that had been done to the Native Americans. We saw how the Europeans had dispossessed them of their entire continent and how they would kill them later on. We saw that. This rampant, aggressive people with little intelligence and understanding and knowledge about the world who were actually the children of the mothers and fathers of civilization who were Africans. Before 70,000 years ago, everybody in the world was black. Because we were still in Africa. We hadn't migrated out to Europe or Asia or anywhere else. Human beings, homo sapiens, rise first on the continent of Africa. Nowhere else. When we understand that, we understand how it was necessary for those who were not at the very beginning of humanity nor at the very beginning of civilization to try to break down the spirit and the will of those who were the ones who invented geometry and who created astronomy and who were the very first to diagnose disease and to build the pyramids. This is black people, African people. No multidimensional human being existed 
before Imhotep, the builder of the Saqqara Pyramid. So don't, don't let people tell you. I mean, you, you don't have to. You, you know what? Stop. Y'all, uh, um, can I just, we, we are among friends here. I know this is probably going to be on YouTube, but it's okay. We still among friends on YouTube. Well, I'm so happy to see Dr. Taiwo Harris here from Howard University. And that's nice. Brother, come all the way. It's one of the great intellectuals that we have right here. Taiwo Harris. And he, he's a strong Afrocentric brother. I'm just happy to see him. And to see Sister Ayo Sakai, a poet, published poet, write her book on Afrocentricity before Afrocentricity. This is that sister. We got some, and then the dancers and the, the drummers, these brothers, give these brothers a hand. They've been with us. They represent the wisdom of our people. Education has always been the core of black people, of African people. We were, we were the first educators. So don't let your children tell you that they can't do something. They can't get it. That they, that we, 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 I don't understand math. Come on. Your, your people invented math. What are you talking about? That's right. you, you don't have that luxury to talk about that. The way we, the reason we talk like that is that's the way white people taught us to talk. That's right. That, that's the very source of it. And that's not from black people. That, that's the source. You, I've been all over the continent of Africa. I've lived in Africa. You don't have a continental African person saying, I, I can't do math. <laughs> you never met one like that. That's, a, that's an American thing. That's right. That's a black, well, that's what they taught us over here. And they had to do that to break our spirit and to break our will, you see? Yeah. So they teach you, you, uh, you know, Africans don't wear no clothes. You say, well, wait a minute, look at all them beautiful shirts and dresses that black people wear now. Oh yeah, but they don't wear no clothes. <laughs> they, 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 trying to, they trying to demean you. You say, well, you know, we had the first university in the world, if you could call it a university because they taught astronomy and grammar and medicine yes. and they taught politics and they taught religion the first one was at Wasa. I'm taking a group to Kemet next year I used to do it more in the 1990s but the last group I took was 2011 same year they had the revolution. But I like to take people to Waset and take them to Ipet Sut, at Karnak Temple, and show them this is where the first university existed. Before there was any Europe, there was not even any place people could identify as Europe. In fact, there was no Greece and no Rome when black people had the first university. That's right. So why would they teach you, oh no, it never was a university in Africa. That is to get at us. Because in a situation where millions of Africans were uprooted from the continent of Africa and brought across the ocean in those rickety ships, some, and many of our people didn't make it. We, we are the children of the ones who couldn't be killed. That's who we are. But many of our people didn't make it. They drowned in the sea. They were thrown overboard. Many of them died on the trails to get down to the sea coast to get on the ships. So when I look at us, that's what I told you. When I stood up here, I told you, we are a noble people and a heroic people and one thing people know about us we will fight until we win and that is that's the that's the spirit of the African people when we see the condition and the situation in Baltimore or wherever we recognize that our brothers sometimes do not understand what is happening to them and why they think that they're under pressure 
to hurt each other. We understand that. But we also understand the abuse and the obscenity and the vileness of those who pressure our people into these situations. We have got to be stronger and to understand what our situation is. No, I'm never for supporting any kind of crime against uh, African people, and I don't uh, uh, condone black people uh, killing black people. Uh, I don't uh, condone black men killing black men. Uh, uh, one thing I understand, though, is that in this society where uh, you have a government uh, that is, I call it a government of uh, provocative mendacity. Wow. Now let me break that down for you. Wow. <laughs> a government that uh, really can be provoked at any minute to lie. Yes. And can lie at will. Yes. And, and sometimes not even at will, just lie. This, this is the government we have in this country. We have a lying government. When you can't believe the President of the United States of America, you, you're in trouble. You, you, you can't believe a word he says when he says it. And so we under that kind of pressure that we've got to be smart enough, intelligent enough to understand what's fact and what's fiction. And a lot of fiction has been thrown at our young men and our young women as well. And so we have to be stronger people. And the only strength we have is strength that comes from the inspiration of our ancestors. Our ancestors gave us that inspiration. And I, I wake up every morning and I thank Marcus Garvey because I say I am able to channel Marcus Garvey in my heart. I'm able to channel Malcolm. I, I know that. This is, this is who we are. And I understand Shake on the Joe. This is the way I see it. That we have to be able to, to, to dictate our own lives and not let other people dictate life for us. Now let me just go through my, I, 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 I'm, I'm only, I told the brother I'm going to be short, so, uh, but I was just getting started through the introduction, but I'm going to go quick now and do, don't, don't worry about me, brother, Sack, go for ways. Don't worry, time. okay, don't worry. No, 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 I'm, I'm fine, I'm good, we good, we all good, it's going to be short, it's going to be good. Let me say it this way. Good. Education was fundamental to us as African people. But Plato, when he was looking at the Greeks, he said that the education of the Greeks was education for pigs. That's what he said. He said the education in Greece is not like that in Egypt. He said the education in Greece is for pigs. He said the Egyptians know how to educate people. Now this is very interesting. In the American system of education, you have a, 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 a uh, 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 we have a big problem. And here's why we have a big problem. You can go through 12 years of uh, a school in American education. When you come out of that education, uh, you still have no understanding of Africa or of African people. You may not even know what African ethnic groups or nations were brought to America when you finish 12th grade. Because I ask me, people say, uh, what are the names of some of the African ethnic groups that came to America on the slave ship? People don't know. Say, well, how can you finish high school and not know that? Well, what happened? That's American education. You can go through American education, finished education, uh, if you are a white person, and you, you go in as a racist, and you can come out as a racist. How, how can you go through college I rather high school, and sometimes people go to four years of college, and you come out uh, just like you went in. You 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 go in as an ignorant racist. You come out as an ignorant racist. You you can go to school in America. You can not only go to school for twelve years, but you can go to school four years of college, and you may even go get an MBA at Wharton. Like President Trump. And you come out and you're still ignorant of the world. Well, what kind of education is that but a bad education? You, you can't have uh, people going to college and getting degrees, sometimes graduate degrees, and have no understanding of the international order. 
In fact, they, they assume that because many times these white people go through these institutions, they come out, they assume because they're white, they're going to run the world. They, they, they just make those assumptions. They don't know what's going on in China or in Africa or, or Brazil or anywhere else. They just, they have this mentality. What kind of education would educate you and give you some kind of uh, uh, a stupid uh, 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 attitude that you believe that Mexico is going to pay for the war? <laughs> what, 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 who, what, where, you, where have you been? Do you not understand that it is, th this is not, the, this is not cowboy territory anymore? You can you have to understand this. And our educational system in this country has done bad things to us as black people. Because we go to school and we go uh, to these institutions and they get us believing uh, that we should imitate the oppressor. And so that's part of the attitude that we see. That we want to be like the oppressor. And our educated, and some of our people, we educated, and they come out, and they're acting like oppressors act. That, that's bad. Any educational system that gets you to love your oppressor is bad. Any religion that gets you to love your oppressor is bad. I don't care who drew the picture. But it's bad. You, you can't, this, this, all these things a part of the confusion. That's part of our problem. And so, so education, though, is core. And that's why I say it's critical to us to have a revolutionary pedagogy. Now, that has to be, it has to be Afrocentric. Now, it's wonderful to be here uh, because you at the Temple of New African Thought, you guys have, have an understanding of this, that black people have been moved off of terms. We've been moved off our own terms. So sometimes we don't even speak on our own terms. We don't even know our own names. And we don't know our names because we've been moved off of our terms. We've been out on our terms. That's why we think we English. That's why we think we Irish. We, 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 we think we German. Well, whatever French, whatever name that the colonizer gave us, the oppressor gave us, we walk around thinking that's our name. You know what I'm saying? We enjoy that. That's not your name. That's the name of your oppressor. That's what your oppressor gave you. And the oppressor gave it to you because the oppressor wanted you always to call the name of his ancestor. And I, I don't do that. I never do that. That's why I like when Brother L.A. was up here and he said he had many names. <laughs> I like that because that's the way I feel. I have many names. That's the way the African tradition was. Many names. Because if you think you got me on this side, you, you, you're wrong. Because you don't know that this is my name over here. You see, That's the way, that's the way our ancestors taught. You can't just have one name anyway. You got to have many names, you see. But the point that I'm making about this education is that the way they educated us was to give us this belief, this attitude, that somehow what the oppressor said was right. And the oppressor himself knew many times that it was wrong. But it was a way to try to figure out how to control this powerful, brilliant black woman and black man. How do, we, how do we do this? And we cut them down by making them believe that they are nothing. They never had any educated education. They never had any clothes. Uh, they never had any language. And you say, well, black people speak 3,000 languages in Africa. And they say, well, you know, black people don't speak languages. They speak dialects. And you see, that's how they try to minimize everything you do, everywhere you go. So to be Afrocentric is for you to center yourself in an African reality. And then you see yourself not as somebody who is a victim to you, but you see someone in control of your own self and your own life, your own concepts, your own history, your own attitudes, your, your own dress, your own name, anything, your own religion, everything. 
Nothing European. You in charge. That's that's a real that's the only way that you, you can do that. You you can't do this by assuming that somehow that Europe will come to rescue you. You you can't be rescued by anybody but yourself. That is the brilliance of Afrocentricity. Because Afrocentricity says that we are responsible agents ourselves, that we create the world, we make the world, and we can walk back on the stage of life, as Maulana Karinga likes to say. Walk back on the stage of life, on the arena of life, as a free and productive people. We can do that, but we have to decide that. We, we have to decide in Baltimore, we're not gonna shoot any brothers. Wow. You know, I mean, and sometimes in a society like this, and I always tell people this, sometimes in a society like this, you have to protect yourself, but you, but you don't have to shoot brothers, but you got to be aware of the society you live in. That is, that's necessary in this society, because I'm telling you something, the Ku Klux Klan was put out of business legally some years ago. So you still see a few groups of them running around in hoods and sheets, but most of them are running around in blue. And you've got to understand that what happened to the Ku Klux Klan was that many of them went into the police force. If they didn't like black people and they felt that the Ku Klux Klan was going to be uh, uh, spotlighted and uh, somebody was going to uh, bring legal action against them, they just said, well, you know, the best way is just to become a police force. And we have to understand, we got to be quick and smart enough to do a critique of domination and a critique of hegemony and a critique of white racism. The fundamental lack about education to me in the HBCUs is that they don't teach a strong course to our black students about, a, I mean, a critical course on analyzing white racial supremacy as a doctrine. That ought to be a fundamental course at all HBCUs. White racial domination, what it is, and how it's maintained, and, and what we can do to undermine it. And that's what, that's why I, I want to see, you, uh, you know, Brother Zach Kofa mentioned about the books I'm writing, that's another book I'm writing on the HBCUs. And another one I'm writing on religion, because I know those two things black people are really interested in, right? You start talking about HBCUs, you start talking about religion, you're going to get some attention. So I'm going I'm to I'm I'm write those books. But the religion one, I have to write too, because it's a part of this whole educational thing. But Afrocentric education is revolutionary education. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to cut the short, uh, my books, I have the book, Revolutionary um, Pedagogy, which is $20, and I have the book Afrocentricity, and I have the book The African Pyramid of Knowledge, which is a very powerful book. I believe one of the best books I've ever written uh, because it gives you so much information and knowledge about African history and culture. They're all very important for Afrocentricity and for uh, revolutionary pedagogy. Now, let me just say this. The fundamental um, thesis that's going around in education these days uh, in terms of educational schools is called critical pedagogy. Now, critical pedagogy is based fundamentally on critical theory, which comes, I, I, I don't want to get too technical on all this, but critical theory, which, com which comes out of uh, the, uh, the, 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 the Marxist and leftist movement with the idea that you should strive for uh, social uh, uh, consciousness that will bring about social justice. So it's a social justice model. And there's nothing, I, I, have, a, I have a lot of um, uh, good comments to say about this notion of social justice because I think it's a, it's a wonderful thing to pursue. Uh, and uh, and it, it, the end of it is to develop multiculturalism. And I have, a, I have good things to say generally about multiculturalism. But let me just say what my critique is and then why I had to do revolutionary pedagogy. Social justice is just one aspect of justice. That's why when we do Nguza Saba and when we do uh, Ma'at, the principles of Ma'at, 
And one of the principles of Mark, uh, when we talk about justice, that that's important. But there, there are different kinds of justice. When you say social justice, it, 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 it means to a lot of people that you're talking about equal opportunity. And, and basically that's what they mean and they may they may mean if you, you you don't do certain things to African Americans that you won't do to white Americans and so forth then they say we bring that about but what I have seen is that the social justice model does not deal with educational or cultural justice in other words uh, my thing is that uh, social justice will just say, okay, we, we all, you, you, everybody has the same opportunity, so black people are here, so we're going to have up some pop-up pop pages in the books to deal with black people. We're going to have some to deal with the Latinos, and all that's multiculturalism, and we're all here good, but we're all under the tent of white people. I, I don't accept that. I cannot accept that. That is, that is not the model that is necessary for education of our children. And in fact, what that model does is keep white supremacy in, in place. Right. What, what you have to have is a revolutionary pedagogy, a, a, a way of instruction and teaching that's revolutionary, that will give us a different way of seeing the world, which will bring about cultural and educational justice. Here's what I mean. When I walk into a school uh, and it's 85% uh, African American, and I don't see any pictures of African American intellectuals, or African American poets, or scholars, or writers on the wall, I, I got a problem with that school. Because what, what, what that school is saying to me is that it does not matter what black people think, or what black people have thought, or what they do. And so uh, what it does is promote still a sense of European uh, dominance over every circumstance, even though you're in a school that says, but we, we believe that we should have the month of February for black people, you see? So all of that is, is that's the social justice. So you gotta have social justice, but you gotta have educational justice. You gotta have cultural justice. You, you, gotta, you gotta see black people as agents of history. We're, we're, history didn't just happen to us, we made history. The greatest conquering queen, a, a king in the history of the world was uh, Thutmosis III. He, he was greater than uh, Napoleon or Caesar or Alexander the Great. But you don't hear him discuss. Thutmosis III led 17 campaigns of war himself in the battle. This is the African king. Alexander only led seven campaigns of war. So I, you don't even put Alexander in the same category with Thutmose III, but they let you do that, and they do that themselves as if the African did not exist. Do you see what I'm saying? You, you got to have not just social justice, cultural and educational justice. You must fight, and our parents must go to the schools and fight for our children. I remember I, my son going to school and writing a paper on Marcus Garvey. And the teacher saying, well, who is Marcus Garvey? Oh, no. Didn't want him to write a paper on Marcus Garvey. I had to go to school. But you got to go to school, too. You got to always go to the school. Black parents have to be involved in these schools. Go, go talk to the teacher. Sit at, tell the principal you would like to sit in the classroom silently and just watch what goes on. You got to do that. Stand up tall and do it. That's how we save our children. That's how we see what's going on in those classrooms. That's why, how we see how they're making, how they're promoting some of them from the school to the prison. You can see it right in the classroom, and then you intervene. We've got to have interference in these situations. The smartest children, some of the smartest children I've seen are elementary black children. Elementary school black kid. And then after the third and fourth grade, something happens. Like, what, what happened to you here? What happened is America. And we've got to intervene. We haven't intervened enough for our children. And the people who teach our children, for the most part, in the United States of America, black kids are taught by white females. That's right. And the white females, many of them are scared of black kids. But you cannot teach our children unless you love our children. That's right. 
Asa Hilliard used to say this a long time ago, that to teach black children is just like teaching any other children. You have to know that these children I'm teaching will one day replace me. You have to have an investment in them because these are the children who will eventually be the ones who will be running the society. You gotta, have, you gotta love the children. That's the first thing. And then, not only must you love the children, you've got to have a robust sense of the content that you want to deliver to these children. You've got to have some knowledge about something. And there's so much knowledge. There's so much we can do. And I can talk for hours about that, but I'm not going to do it. But we, I just want you to say, I love what you are doing here. I appreciate you. And uh, Brother uh, Osa and Brother Sankofa uh, and all of the people who work with you. And I hope that one day uh, we will have a good, strong chapter of Afrocentricity International uh, located here because Afrocentricity International is an international African, Pan-African organization that connects groups like this to groups all over the world. We have groups in Rio, uh, in Salvador, in Brazil. Uh, we have uh, groups in, in Cape Town, Johannesburg. Uh, we have groups that are forming all over Africa, South America, Buenaventura in Colombia. Uh, many, many groups, Afrocentricity International. You can go on the website, www.dyabukam.com, and you will see uh, the many chapters that we have of African, uh, Afrocentric, Pan-African organizations that are based around organizations such as this, who are connected, all the leaders are connected all over the world, People travel between different cities and they go directly to their Afro Afrocentricity International uh, brothers and sisters and are able to move about and do things toward Pan-Africanism, toward building the United States of Africa. Because that's what we, uh, we, we, we found that uh, our unity, there are a lot of things that disunite us, but the two things that unite us in Afrocentricity International is the concept of the United States of Africa and the concept that we must always honor and cherish our ancestors. And we don't let anybody fight against our ancestors or say anything damaging about our ancestors. Someone says something about Nat Turner, you say Nat Turner was the most heroic person to live in America. If somebody says something bad about Harriet Tubman, you said no greater person has ever lived in America than Harriet Tubman. If somebody says something to you about Malcolm, you say nobody has ever been more eloquent than Malcolm. You, you have to speak up. If we speak up, then we tell our own truth. And our own truth is just as valuable as anybody else's truth. And the Afrocentrist always says that there are no historical experiences any greater than the experiences that you and your people have had. Ashe. We can do better than that, family. Give it up for Dr. Kenny Asante. That's right, that's right. That's right. I do believe, Dr. Santi, that there may be some who have some questions, all right? Uh, so uh, if we can keep it brief and go, uh, have a few questions, Dr. Santi, would, would that be in order? All right, so uh, based on the wonderful uh, message and presentation that Dr. Santi provided, all right, at this time, you could be able to uh, ask him a question, and uh, we'll keep the number of questions limited, all right? Sister? All right. Okay, yes. the question I have, you said that our ancestors was great yes. One of the things that they did educate was religion. Yes. What was that religion called? Yes. How was it taught? Very good question. Sister asked, what was religion, what was the religion called? And uh, let, let me start, that's a good question, sister. First of all, and people should know this, that the first people to name God were black people. Nobody named God before us. Right. Neither the Arabs, who call the supreme Allah, nor the Jews, who call the supreme Jehovah. None of these names, neither of these names, existed before the name Ra. Ra. 
and the name Amen. Or the name Patah or Atun. These were four names by which the black people called the supreme deity long before the Arabs and long before the Jews. So that's the first thing. You need to, you, you, you take this to heart. You know this. You walk around with this in your heart. You teach your children this. That the first people to that where we have written down where, people, where the name of the divine was given. The first people to do that were black people. Nobody before that, as far as we know. So that's the first thing. Second thing is this, that the notion of religion as having a name is a European question. See, Europeans did this kind of separation. For African people, your way of life was your religion. If you were, if you were a Yoruba person, and you grew up among the Yoruba, uh, you, 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 you were Yoruba. That's, that's the way you lived. That's what it was. <laughs> you were Yoruba. Well, the closest thing we have to that is what the Jews say. When they say, well, I'm a Jew, they, they mean their religion is Jewish. Many times, sometimes they can say they're culturally Jewish, but they now practice the religion. But but you get but but the idea is that your religion is you, it's your way of life, it's who you are. So people ask me, for example, what religion are you? I say I'm African. So so this, and when you go to the, go to the doctor and say what's your religion, I say African. Because the question is, well, what do you want me to say? That's who I am. That's where I practice. I love my ancestors. I call upon them. That's my, so, so the first major concept of, re, of what we call religion, and religion is really not one of those good terms. Uh, the first major concept is Maat. That's why you heard the people say the principles, the cardinal principles of Maat, because according to the text, the ancient African text, the only idea that was with God, with the supreme God, Ra, at the beginning was Maat, as a goddess, you see? Yes. Brothers, you know it's a joy to talk to you. Thank you. I was reflecting on your critique of HBCU. Yes, sir. And as you know, I'm a out of Sojourner Douglas College, yes. God rest us, and maybe may may we one day bring it back. Yes, sir. Uh, we uh, we used to teach a class called the Psychology of Racism. Yes. That was that was required for every student, and every student had to get that understanding to come out of Sojourner Douglas. That's College. right. I went over to Coppin and was invited to speak at a Social Justice Institute. Yes. It was a master's in their, their, edu their master's of education program. Yes. And I spoke and shared with them concepts of the pedagogy of the oppressed, the miseducation of the Negro, and the people in their class almost attacked me <laughs> I know. physically. Uh, but well, I, you know, you know, I've been there too, right? <laughs> I, know, I know what you're talking about. Attack almost attacked me physically. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, except the one student who was a graduate of Sojourner, <laughs> who sat in the background just shaking his head and yeah. saying as if, "Now you know what I'm up against." Yeah, it's, it's, you it's, know, this brother. is uh, this is what we need to address. Now the faculty, by the way came to my defense. That's good. The dean of the students came into the class and said, no, no, you need to listen to this. He even wrote on the board, the miseducation of the Negro. You know how to read this. And the students were busy writing that name down as if it was the first time in their educational experience that they'd they even had been exposed to the concept of the miseducation of the Negro. I just wanted to share. That I, I thank you for sharing that, but that, but you you've raised it as part of the issue that I'm dealing with. If you go to the bookstores at most of the HBCUs, many of them don't have any black books. Right. So you ask now. Here we have this great resource, over a hundred colleges that we have. We have the students right in our hands. 
We don't even introduce them to the African uh, uh, authors that are writing, unless as one, as one, as they told me at Delaware State once, the, we only have the books that the, te that the teachers uh, ask us to have in the bookstore. My thing is that if you're gonna have a serious bookstore, and you ought to have, all these black colleges ought to have serious bookstores, where people just on their own, casually, not even for our class, just want to read Toni Morrison. Well, why I can't find Toni Morrison's book in, in the bookstore at an HBCU? Why isn't she a part of the curriculum? Why isn't she a part of the curriculum? Why don't you have a whole class on her? So these are serious issues to me. I don't, I don't quite understand it. That's why I'm doing research to try to figure out why we, why you would run into that problem where they don't know Carter G. Woodson have never heard his name. You know, say, so how, how where, where are we on this? So you raise a very important point, and I just want to say this, and I'm so sorry in a way that uh, um, Sojourner Douglas closed, but Sojourner Douglas was one of the two, one of the three universities that gave me an honorary doctorate. So I have a doctorate from Sojourner Douglas, and I appreciate you and all the people who worked for that great institution. Yes. She's asked a great question about religion, too. Um, boy, that's, as I told you, I'm, I'm writing a book now on spirituality, African spirituality. And I, I have been studying this issue. First of all, because people always want to know what religion am I. I, I I'm neither Christian, nor Jewish, nor Muslim. So you can get, get wipe that out of your mind. So I'm none of that. <laughs> that's, that's my real, that's, I always have to say that because later on people ask me, well, what church do you go to? What, what you know, are you in the mosque? No, I, 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 all those are foreign to me. I don't do any of that. What, what I do believe though about the church is that the, some of the churches have been useful. Uh, in the past, with the civil rights movement, some of the churches worked very well with our organizations for social justice. But there were some who were against it because the church I grew up in was totally against Martin Luther King Jr. We believed he was preaching a social gospel and preaching the social gospel was not going to get you to heaven. So, so, I, so I know that all church, people say, that all, oh, the Christian church helped. No, 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 all of them didn't. Some of them did, all right? So that's just one thing. Third thing is that there are some preachers now, and I have a, and people find this, it shouldn't be contradictory, but people find uh, uh, this interesting, that uh, many of my friends are preachers. It's very interesting, and and, uh, and and some imams. So it's very interesting, and I think it's because they they, they find that they, they believe I'm bold by challenging religion. You know what I mean? They just want to know, brother, what, what do you think? So so I've had discussions with a lot of them, and and we have some good preachers and some good imams who really want to make changes and see changes, but the congregations don't want them to make the changes. That is the thing. Y'all who go to those churches, y'all are so conservative and reactionary sometimes that the preachers can't do what they want to do because they say, no, nah, my church won't pay me. They revolt against this, all that. So people get nervous about their livelihood. You know, and so that's the that's the problem. But you are right by mentioning it because the churches like the HBCUs, they give us these these free populations of black people willing to be taught, but we don't teach them. That's right. We don't I, when they when they invite me, we have a very uh, 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 
a big church in uh, Philadelphia. When they invite me for their Africa Day, that's normally when they invite me for the Africa Day. We'll bring Dr. <laughs> Santi in, right? But when they, right, it's amazing when I talk like I've just talked here today. They like it. They understand. Most of the people seem to understand it. They get it. You see, but we don't give them that information anymore. We don't tell them the history of Africa. We don't give them that background. So I say to the preachers, I want you. I want them to learn. They need to have seminars with African historians who would teach them so that they will understand that Christianity did not bring us through slavery. Like what one, one, one preacher, uh, Eddie Glau, uh, uh, who was who did, got, did a master's degree with me, and then went off to Princeton and he teaches at Princeton. Sometimes he's on CNN, but he wrote a book which was which was horrible about Exodus, showing that black people were like Jews, but then also in the book saying that uh, that the spirituals, the spiritual songs brought us through slavery. That's not true. Only 15% of the Africans who were enslaved were Christians. And our, in Christianity for us came after the enslavement. After 1865, when the white missionaries in the north decided to send down missionaries to teach the black people, us, Christianity, and to so-called civilize us. That's what, so if you, that's when it came. So if you go to my church in Georgia, my home, this is a home, home church, that church was started in 1875. Not, not in, not in 1775. Not in 1675. What what kind of religion did we have? Go look what the white people said. Rutherford B. Hayes in 1890. He wrote this about the Mohawk Conference on the Negro. That the six to seven million Negroes in the South, the majority of whom practice voodoo paganism, now, I don't know whether, and voodoo, remember, voodoo is a religion. And all the only thing I'm old enough to know that when I was a child, my mother certainly did wrap a rabbit's foot around my ankle and around my neck to keep the evil spirits away. So even as, when I was a child in South Georgia, they still remembered some of the things that our people tried to remember from coming from the continent of Africa. So, no, I don't think that, uh, I think that the churches need to be taken over by a group of revolutionary people and made Afrocentric. That means they got to take down the white Jesus, though. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I make them short, okay? How you doing? Yeah, fine. I would have this, this question in my mind, so I might as well start with you. There's so much information overload, right? So, if you had to take one book, let's say I want to start a book club, I'm going to ask 50 Afrocentric scholars to pick 12 books besides their own, because the first people they write their own book, they say this is the best book. 12 books that they can read once a month that is that you feel that is essential for a person, an African person growing up in America. They said, man, if you just read these books, you have not everything, but you have a basic understanding of our tradition. And number two, you'll be hungry for more knowledge. And number three, if you met someone else from another part of the country who also read these books, you will never be on the same page. I know you can't get the, maybe not get the answer now, but I think maybe I'll contact you later and say, brother, what's your list? Your books will automatically be included as extra. But I said, if I can give, if I can ask you for 12 books written by some other the other one for you, and you say, man, if the brother and sister would just read these books and understand information in there. And well, have well, I understand you. Okay. Let me just let me let me just give you some of the books. I'll give you a few of the books that I read. So I won't give you any of my 83, which are the best. But <laughs> let me just give you some of the books that I've read. I, I, I read I read Carter G. Woodson. The Miseducation of the Negro. I read John Jackson, Introduction to African Civilization. 
John Jackson, Introduction to African Civilization. I read Chancellor Williams, The Destruction of Black Civil Civilization. I read Sheikh Anta Diop, D-I-O-P, The African Origin of Civilization. But we'll just stop there for now. All right, one last question. You can contact me, Brother, brother Asan Kofa has my information. Will you? Yeah. Yes, sir. No, it's funny, like, about a month or two ago, I started reading your book and I had... Uh, oh, okay. Uh, African Centricity. Oh, good. Uh, I like the part where you talked about relationships. Yes. I understood what you got to. I want to talk about, well, can you explain Afrocentric love? Yeah, that's a good question. He, he and he, he, uh, he yeah, let, let me say it quickly because I can go on and on on that subject. But here's the best thing to say about that. That... When you as a person look for a partner, you should look for someone who is going to be, uh, it should not just be emotional, it, it, it should be logical, it should be rational I should say, rational, it could be a rational decision. You, you have to look for someone who is going to uh, uh, assist and someone you can assist in bringing into being an African way of understanding of the world. You want a relationship to be on, on, on an equal footing in terms, on the same page in terms of what your mission is in life. That's why I say you, a, a brother should want his wife or woman to be a Harriet Tubman. You should want your man to be a Marcus Garvey. This is the this is the way I think. Somebody who is who who will speak truth and and who has a who has a strong sense of togetherness and love for African people. That's the best person you can have. That person will love you because you want a person who is committed and deeply uh, 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 enmeshed in the struggle for our people. Because if they're not, they won't be imagined in you either. Okay. Give it up for Dr. Malefic Kitty Asante family, give it up. All right, all right, all right. As I said before we came up, Dr. Asante is no stranger to the Temple of New African Thought. We're actually reading his book as part of our Rashule book study on Sundays from 9.45 a.m. to 11 o'clock a.m. All right, so if you want more information about that, you can see myself. It's each and every Sunday, except for the second Sunday each month. And as I said also, he's been on our, our Conscious Black Business Network uh, show, or our off-the-cuff conversation show, not once, but twice. All right, so he's a family member. We appreciate Dr. Asante taking time out of his busy schedule to come and speak to us. Give it up for him one more time, family. I shave. Absolutely. He has uh, his latest book, Revolutionary Pedagogy, all right? He also has Afrocentricity. What's the third book that you have over there as well? African Pyramids of Knowledge. African Pyramids of Knowledge, all right? So let's try to make it so he comes back empty. He hits the road with nothing that he came with, all right? Uh, and Dr. Asante uh, mentioned a few other works, all right, to the question that was put out in terms of some books uh, to be able to peruse through, expose yourself to, and read. And so we have a table on the conscious, I mean, the Temple of African Thought, information about our organization, and some of those books are there. Now, those are not for sale. However, I would say you can go to everyone's place, all right? Everyone's place, that's right. Uh, a black establishment and a black pillar in our community. All right, over on West Side, just go over there, and all that is there and much more. All right. Uh, so, with the assistance of the drum circle here, what we want to do is we want to uh, put some social economic systems in place. And some of y'all may say, well, "What do you mean, my brother Sankofa? What are you talking about? All the things that we have taking place in the Temple of New African Thought, our real estate investing programs, as I already spoke about, our conscious Black Business Network, getting real information out to our people using a media platform, our rites of passage manhood training programs that we offer at the Temple of New African Thought right here, our African-centered counseling services that we offer by our most esteemed minister, Sar Dennis Winkler." Our all right? Our drumming circle, which takes place on Sundays. Our Sunday NGO fellowship, 
which takes place on Sundays as well, where you can be able to pay homage to our ancestors and hear words of upliftment and empowerment and be a part of the healing circle. Morning meditation. All of these things would not be made possible, family, if it's not for the energy and the commitment and the dedication that we put towards it. Ashe? Our institutions are only as good as the effort that we put into them. And oftentimes, either consciously or subconsciously, we go out of our way to support other in, uh, interests that don't have our best interests.